Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on sports marketing. Uh, we will now start uh, with just some general information. Uh, this webinar will consist of two panels. The first one uh, will be presented by our special guest. Jeff Wilson, who's a leading sports strategist and FIFA consultant. And the second one will be on social media analytics, presented by me, Georgi. If you have any questions during uh, the webinar, you can use the chat function. Otherwise, after the second panel, we'll have a Q&A session where you'll be able to uh, ask your questions. So uh, now I'll give the floor to, to Jeff. Jeff, welcome. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, uh, Jordi. A uh, real pleasure to, to, to be here and hello to everybody. Um, what, what I will do is I will go through a case study uh, that hopefully you can take different learnings and bring them into your, your own sport, your own event or your own business uh, and uh, I'll uh, so, 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 so we'll, we'll take maybe 20-25 minutes to do, to do that. So just to give you a little bit of, of background, uh, the Ulster Grand Prix uh, is a, a, a road race on uh, public roads in Northern Ireland. It's actually the part of, uh, in the 1970s, part of the World Series is what you see now, the likes of MotoGP and all the rest of it. It was part of a World Series in the 70s and it actually is the world's fastest road race and it's in August each year uh, and it was created in 1922. But like anything, uh, there were issues uh, around the Ulster Grand Prix. There was a lack of funding, uh, there was lack of spectators, uh, there was no clear strategic plan and uh, the lack of media exposure as well. And that all created a problem and an issue in that uh, the event was basically going into, in, into the red. Um, just that the slides isn't moving forward there, guys. If we can move the slide forward for me. Yeah, so go to the next, the next slide. Okay, so what did we do? So uh, in 2009, and the, the first thing that I would say is, uh, what happened is the Ulster Grand Prix came to me and said, Jeff, look, can we have some help uh, with the Ulster Grand Prix? Uh, said, well, look, what, what's wrong? And they said, look, lack of funding, lack of spectators, uh, lack of media exposure. Uh, what we want is sponsors. And my response was actually, no, that's the last thing that you need is sponsors. What you need is to sort out your event and sort out your product. And that's exactly what we did. And we started with research. And that's the first thing that I would say to you is research. Make sure that whatever you're doing, whether it's an event, whether it's a sports tech company, whether it's a football club, whether it's a sports club, uh, start off with research. Research with all stakeholders, fans, government, potential sponsors, current sponsors, uh, media, get a holistic view of, of the event. And what you'll find by doing that research is you will identify uh, some key areas and key issues that you can then start to address and put into a, a, a strategic plan. And that's what we did. We started off with a research focus group. And I remember it was in February 2009. And I, I asked the question, tell me about the Ulster Grand Prix. And after a while, somebody happened to say, it, the conversation just went like this, blah, 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 blah. It's the world's fastest road race, blah, 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 blah. I stopped them and I said, whoa, 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 what did you say? The world's fastest road race. My first question, is that not the TT in the Isle of Man? No. And the second question, can it be beating? Can it be beaten? And the guy said, well, yes, but you need to be extremely quick. And from that, what we said, that's what we will hang our hat on. That's what we will uh, drive as our uniqueness of our event. 
the world's fastest road race. And that was extremely important because from research, the second thing that I would say is to get your brand right. Most people will consider a brand to be a logo. It's one small element of branding. And what we did is we, yes, we did change our logo, but what we did is we created brand values, a brand proposition, a brand equity, a brand vision, and we made a, a brand strap line. And all of these four or five things came together to create the brand that we see today at the Ulster Grand Prix being the world's fastest road race. But this gave us a uniqueness, a unique proposition, a unique place, and that started from research. But the brand helped us to really build onto the event. So what else did we do? Well, we created a new board, uh, a new board of professional people with different skill sets. What else did we do? We created a strategic plan, extremely important. Once we de developed the research and we understand our brand and what the product was all about, we developed a strategic plan. And I would challenge you guys, make sure you have a strategic plan. Have you a mission? Have you a vision? Have you strategic goals? And have you objectives? And have you an action plan under each of your objectives and your goals? Then what we did is we created a marketing plan and a commercial plan. So where we had issues with funding, before 2009 we had one sponsor that sponsored everything. And we changed that. We developed a plan where we had sponsors that were sponsoring different parts of the event. That helped us to generate revenue. But then we looked at other revenue areas outside of sport, such as corporate hospitality, uh, etc., etc., etc. So what else did we do? We set up as a business, a limited company, and then we created a fans engagement program. How do we engage with the fans that, that go to the Ulster Grand Prix? This event attracts 50,000 people from all over the world. So how do we engage with them, not only during Bike Week, but outside Bike Week? And that's what we did. So to give you just a, a, a little bit more uh, detail, just to move to the next slide. So what we did is we then developed some strategic pillars. So the first strategic pillar that we did is, uh, just go forward on, on there, yep. So the first strategic pillar we did is develop and promote outside of Bike Week. This was extremely important for us to develop this strategic goal, to develop and promote outside of Bike Week. So how can we increase the brand? How can we get people knowing more about the Ulster Grand Prix when the race outside of Bike Week, which Bike Week runs for about five to seven days in August. So how do we make sure that our brand has got longevity throughout the year? Then what we did is how do we develop inside of Bike Week? So what fans engagement programs can we develop inside of Bike Week that really engages with our fans and the riders and the spectators? on a regular basis that, that is more than just racing. And this was important because what this did for us, it helped us to create our product. So not only did we have the actual racing on the third, the Wednesday, Thursday and Saturday, but we created more products uh, on the Monday, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. And that gave us much, much more to talk about. Then, which is a little bit more of a visionary statement, we wanted to create a World Road Racing Championship. And my challenge to you guys would be, have you got a vision, a dream? And what is your dream? How do you sustain your business? How do you sustain your club and your team? How do you sustain your event? And we believe being part of a bigger and wider championship. Uh, bear in mind, in the 1970s, we were part of a world short and, and road series championship in the 1970s. So we wanted to, to look at that. So what specifically did we do? No particular uh, things to learn here, but we started to conduct launch events. So two months before the actual event, we announced to the world that the Ulster Grand Prix was happening. We always made sure we brought riders uh, to our event and we always made sure that we in invited key stakeholders. Do you have launch events or key events where you can bring media to? Uh, and also, 
government officials and other key stakeholders and really engage with them in events such as a launch event. We then looked at income streams. The very important bit here is beforehand we had one or two income streams. Key for us, and again another learning, is how can you widen your income streams that you're not putting all your eggs into one basket. So you're looking at a variety of income. So we created, uh, bear in mind this is an enclosed public road, but the principles are the same. We created spectator areas in key areas of the, the track that allowed people to buy those seats. We then uh, started, uh, these two girls here have got an earpiece, uh, and what we did is, this is these earpieces allowed people around the seven mile track to listen live to the radio on racing. So no matter where you're at, you can hear who is first, second and third. One of the things that we do at the Ulster Grand Prix is we have our own radio station. So people can tune in to our own radio station and find out what's happening during bike week as well as who's first, second and third. But from an income stream, we sold these radios and we also got them sponsored. You'll see the yellow lanyards. This is sponsored. So this generated for us new money. Then we engaged uh, government. And again, if you're a club, uh, if you're an event, or if you're a sports tech company, you will have uh, opportunities to engage with government, whether it's on mentoring or whether it's funding. Uh, and we see this in three areas in, in the Ulster Grand Prix for government. Number one is capital investment. And actually tomorrow we are meeting our sports minister up at the Ulster Grand Prix for some capital investment projects to build the, the, the actual um, paddock at the Ulster Grand Prix. Second of all, we see it about tourism. Does your event drive tourism? If it does, why not go to your local tourism people and tell them about the bed nights that you're driving for on the back of your event or your matches or whatever you're doing? And then the third is program related, so marketing funding that promotes the event outside of Northern Ireland so people worldwide can come to Northern Ireland. Then what we did is we built a new house, a new home at the Ulster Grand Prix called the David Wood House, but we got people to buy a brick. So people were able to physically give us five pounds sterling and we were able to buy, people were able to buy a brick and get their name onto a brick. Then what we did is we created a supporters club. You will no doubt have a supporters club, but we created a supporters club that generated revenue for us. Then we generated revenue from TV. Lots is going on now in the area of Facebook Live, uh, Twitter Live. So if you can't get on to BBC or ITV or Fox Sports, there are other ways that you can still drive revenue through social live streaming. Then we looked at corporate hospitality. We put a corporate marquee tent, and here we cater now for 350 VIP guests who pay top dollar, uh, but we give them a great experience. There's question and answers with riders of the past. Right through the day, they get uh, access to TV, live TV streams, that follow the, the race on, on the back of our helicopter. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the point I want to mention here, uh, three or four years ago, the people who supplied the food was not good enough, and we got rid of them. So if you have suppliers that are not good enough, get rid of them. Make sure your suppliers are at as high quality as what you expect, because that affects your brand. Um, we can honestly say that with now getting rid of the, the, the poor supplier, the good supplier coming in for food has meant that we are now sold out on our VIP and it adds to the overall experience. Like anything, then we look at merchandising. Nothing new here, but what we do is we drive merchandising through online and through outlets. Have you got a sponsor that's maybe a supermarket? Can you sell products, maybe unique products, through those partners, through those supermarkets? Are you looking not only at your replica kits, but you're looking at leisure range, like what you see here? 
and these is leisure range targeted at females and you'll see on the back you'll just see the little bit on the back the world's fastest road race uh, this is a brand image is everywhere at the event so where you see our logo you see the world's fastest road race so it's constant so whatever you do on your message make sure you have one clear message that is constantly promoted and that means even if you do a launch event your chairman or your president who is announcing must mention the words of your strap line the world's fastest road race to really make sure that message gets across so then what we looked at well people if people are coming to Northern Ireland to watch why not make money through travel packages so we now package up uh, wristbands with a with a boat uh, together with uh, hotels or maybe it's airlines with boats and hotels so we generate money through um, uh, th through travel just like maybe some of you guys where you have tickets we have got wristbands and we generate money and we do early bird offers to really drive wristband sales this is a very very looks very busy but remember beforehand we had one sponsor now we have I don't know 21 sponsors and basically we have quadrupled our revenue coming in from these sponsors the sponsor that you see at the top Metzler uh, they uh, we went to meet them a uh, great relationship with them and I remember when we did the deal I asked them tell me why did you come to the Ulster Grand Prix to look for a sponsorship and as quick as anything they said because it's the world's fastest road race they got our brand and they seen how our brand matches in with their brand and that's very important when you go for sponsorship making sure you match their objectives with your own objectives and you really can um, get out there a real very clear fans engagement plan and also that data so what do we do marketing wise well we've got our own app our app allows you from a fans engagement point of view to guess who's going to win uh, it talks about the weather etc uh, etc et we've got our website look there it is again the world's fastest road race we have programs that we also sell we've got our Facebook site uh, that we would really push a lot mainly during the build up to bike week uh, it's a little bit less for example now uh, because of bike weeks over but when we have events we do a lot of push there email big one if you don't have a database at the minute get one start to build your database this year for the first time we have a database but uh, this time for the first time when somebody bought a program from one of our resellers we asked them to give us their email address so we do a lot in this area of gathering emails we have a helicopter and the helicopter they follow the leaders all around the circuit and uh, this is then beamed onto three massive screens that helps with the fans engagement we have our own radio station and these are the screens these are 18 wheel trucks that come in to three locations around the event and they then that this big massive screen uh, pops up and the helicopter live streams the, the, what is happening live onto these big screens so people can really see uh, and what's happening in the race no matter where they're at we then look outside of bike week remember our, our goals we look at different events uh, such as bike festivals and make sure that we're front and center we do ambassador programs you will see uh, this guy uh, is live on on TV and his helmet is the Ulster Grand Prix and uh, we, so we do a lot on that ambassador program PR we drive lots through PR and if you're not doing that I would recommend that you do really use PR to drive your brand message and again we, we would use PR regularly Ian Air, the Liverpool football clip chief executive was over with us recently and uh, we did a lot of PR with him specifically got lots of exposure we do a lot in the corporate social responsibility program we've been to universities 
the, the masters and marketing students and ask them to develop marketing plans for the Ulster Grand Prix in the future. So we really tap into you know, uh, leading edge stuff. Again, getting back to fans engagement, uh, we, this is one of the events that we have, that we held, that we hold every year, over 700 people. And they all meet uh, before the race, and it's a Q&A, a question and answer with about nine riders. Real great nights fun, great nights crack. And what we would do here is we look at how can we improve the likes of these events. Let me give you one example. Everybody wants these guys' signatures, their autographs. And this year, for the first time, we put a branded blank piece of paper with just the, the Ulster Grand Prix logo on it so that uh, they can take that and take it to the riders and get it autographed. So that meant that our brand was front and centre. So think of the fine detail to make your event a, a really great experience. So, so important. Again, on fans' engagement, getting into bikes, what we did is try and break a world record. If we are the world's fastest road race, how can we break a world record for the number of different makes and models in one location, which is a Guinness Book of Records? And the amount of hype and buzz that we got around us, and it cost us nothing. So the point I would like to bring out here, sometimes for fans, fans' engagement, you can do something for free. And the publicity we got because we were trying to break a world record was great. Again, another fans' engagement, and I'll just let you know I'm almost finished. Uh, these guys are called the Jamara Destroyers, former world champions, and we did a ride out in their local town, and that went from their local town and finished at the Ulster Grand Prix paddock, and we had over 200 motorbikes that went probably about 10 to 15 miles from a town right the way to the, to the, to the Ulster Grand Prix. Fantastic buzz in the village or in the town. The town was grateful because we brought 200 people in. People spent money in the town, so that was great. We got great publicity and 200 riders, potential customers, came to our paddock, of which we then sold them wristbands. But the experience that people got was fabulous, and it cost us nothing. So then we look at other things such as selfie images. We do Periscope behind the scenes, and we use Periscope mainly for behind the scenes. And what we would do is, um, I don't know whether we can play this, uh, but we would do little videos, and the videos that we did here is with another motorcycle news. This helped us to amplify the content. And what this is, is a GoPro that's strapped to our clerk of the course. So uh, because it's not maybe that clear, you get the idea. But what we did is we, we linked in with a media outlet, so they amplified our message. So can you do that? Can you do something unique, put a GoPro onto the front of the person? And look, there's the front of the grid. There's the motorbikes ready to go. A unique experience that fans can see digitally. Then what happens from time to time, we get uh, uh, crashes. Oops, sorry, only two more slides ago. Um, we get crashes. So look at the guy at the front. Just watch the guy at the front. And this guy had a, a very bad crash. And uh, this went viral. We got one million hits inside two days. Now, this is an awful crash, but what people ended up saying, the organizers took the hedge out. You see, watch when he comes, there is no hedge. And people started to talk about our safety by taking the hedge out. So then we built an Ulster Grand Prix house, of only a couple of slides to go. And this house allows us to rent the paddock in when the Ulster Grand Prix is not happening. So another point I will say to you, have you got a facility, whether that's a stadium, a, a, a business centre, or whatever, how can you use that stadium to drive revenue 
when your event isn't on. So we hire out this uh, facility to other people to do with motorbikes. We hire out the paddock. So we now have had 24 events in the paddock during the year. And this means we're using and sweating the asset. We're using the facility time and time again. So how can you sweat your assets? So the results, we now are making money. Our brand is being built. We're getting more people, 50,000 people compared to 10,000. And we have 600 volunteers that we do a lot in that area of volunteers. So that gives the end of my talk. And I know it's very quick, but I would say to you in summary, do research, start with research. Get your brand right, not your logo, but your brand. Have a strategic plan. Look at revenue and income streams. Have one clear message that's communicated all the time. Build your database. Use PR to drive your brand and awareness of your event. And how can you be different? How can you sweat your existing assets and build up that, uh, that asset that you have uh, in your event, such as buildings, etc., etc.? Thank you. Okay, so Jeff, thanks. Thanks a lot for, for this amazing uh, presentation and story. And hi again, my name is Georgi and I'm responsible for marketing here at Pometric. So in the second part of this webinar, we'll take a look at how social media analytics can support marketing strategy development in sport and events. Before uh, we look at the case studies, many case studies that we've prepared, uh, I would like to point out that at Cometric we take what is essentially a media agnostic approach to analytics which allows us to garner insights from practically all leading social media networks as well as news forums and blogs. The examples we provide here are based however on social listening only on Twitter and Facebook as these are the biggest and most important social networks for sports marketers. We will present the case studies from a sport consumer behavior perspective due to its specifics and difference from consumer behavior in other industries uh, such as FMCG for example. In this regard we have selected three case studies looking at different sports or sport objects, one of which uh, is of course the Ulster Grand Prix Jeff uh, talked about at length in the first part of the webinar. So the framework I will use to contextualize the application of social media analytics to support consumer behavior is the so-called psychological continuum model or the PCM, which suggests that watching, playing, or otherwise engaging in sport consumption activities progresses along four general hierarchical stages. And these are, as you can see, awareness, attraction, attachment, and allegiance. What is especially good about the PCM is that it, it enables the creation and testing of hypotheses applicable to understanding conceptually distinct behaviors in sport, recreation, tourism, and leisure. Now off to the first stage, awareness, and here we turn to the first mini case study covering a recent viral campaign by Nike in India. Uh, but before that, uh, a few words about the awareness stage. Most notable in this stage is the focus on the consumer socialization process as an important means to describe how a sport object is introduced 
to an individual's life. And in this slide, uh, we, we give you a simplified example of life cycle segmentation in sport, uh, which basically allows us to explore the when and how awareness occurs. Naturally, this uh, segmentation can be used in conjunction with other segmentation strategies. And what we see here is that different socializing agents are stronger in different stages um, of, of a person's life, uh, with children being socialized into sports most often by parents and relatives, but later on in later stages like adolescence and adulthood, it is media and including social media that can be that can be claimed to be the, the strongest socializing agent of all. As a matter of fact, I'm sure that you'd all agree that media is increasingly influencing also children aged five and older, so uh, it may well be overtaking other socializing agents. So how is social media uh, shaping awareness? Well, you know, this happens by influencing uh, the way we think and feel about our environment. Uh, the concrete example uh, that I mentioned, the Nike campaign in India, that is the Dada Ding, you may have seen that, if, if not, go on YouTube and, and check on it. Uh, so this campaign is an excellent example of driving awareness through sports subcultures and viral marketing. Generally, sport in India has a massive image problem, particularly for women. So for this campaign, Nike commissioned a crew of female household celebrities that best represents sport in India right now, with a view to, to presenting athleticism as aspirational and sport is sexy. Uh, what we did here was uh, by social listening on Facebook through Facebook topic data, which gives us access to user interactions across the entire Facebook in an anonymized way, we were basically able to measure different aspects of the campaign's virality, which uh, you can see on the slide. What is interesting here is that among the topics driving most engagement are some of the female athletes featuring in the campaign video, uh, such as the Indian film actress and former national badminton player Deepika Padukone, uh, national hockey player Rani Rongpao, and national football player Giori Amber. Right. So off to the next stage. Oh, now it seems that I have. Oh, right. Uh, sorry for that. Up to the next stage of the 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 motto attraction. Uh, and actually for, for this and the next one, attachment, we'll use uh, Twitter analytics on the Ulster Grand Prix event discussed in the first part of the webinar. Uh, the attraction stage provides a number of opportunities and challenges for sports marketers. In this regard, uh, research indicates that using social media or visiting a website is essentially a self-selecting behavior and only consumers with an existing interest or attraction toward a particular sport object will engage in uh, information search behavior or social media activity. Due to its open nature and sizable band of public data, we recommend Twitter as a cornerstone of your analysis into any market. Furthermore, it should be used to inform uh, also a wider marketing strategy, not just social media, 
as it's uh, an accurate representation of what people are actually engaging with, what they care about, and how you can reach them. Not only that, but it can be customized to, to tap into a segment of the market that you are interested in reaching. In the case of the Oster Grand Prix, a geographic location analysis of its Twitter audience split by volume and reach, and reach, by the way, is the volume or the number of tweets multiplied by the author's follower base, reveal some interesting insights about where the UGP, the Oster Grand Prix, main audiences are and how active they are. This can be leveraged when looking to make deals with sponsors, broadcast partners, and influencers in various markets. Naturally, uh, the amount of tweets, followers, or engagers you have in an area is one set of metrics that you can use to gauge where your brand currently sits, but it only tells you part of the story. A thoughtful application of social media analytics shows a much clearer and I would say larger picture of who your brand is currently able to reach if it utilized its full potential. You know that like uh, many social networking sites, Twitter flattens, essentially flattens multiple audiences into one, a phenomenon known as context collapse. In this regard, uh, what we did was uh, qualitatively analyze the top 200 Twitter accounts in the Oster Grand Prix audience by reach to arrive at the segmentation of its total audience into several smaller audiences of interest for marketing communication purposes. And again, these were split according to volume and reach to identify further potential for audience amplification. If you look at the chart on the right, you will notice that uh, celebrities have the highest reach in spite of their low volume uh, of Twitter activity, which is probably uh, not unexpected. Right, so attachment. Attachment, or the, the third uh, phase of, of the PCM model, represents the emotional, functional, and symbolic meaning an individual places on a sport object. Sport market in action within the attachment stage involves personalization, essentially. And a challenge for sport marketers is to learn consumer content requirements. In fact, the majority of customer loyalty programs currently being deployed in sports marketing are designed to move an individual from attraction to the attachment stage. In this regard, a content analysis of a large sample of tweets posted during the bike week of the Oster Grand Prix allowed us to find out what the Oster Grand Prix audiences are engaging with or care about. You can see the most prominent topics and their respective share in the UGP conversation on the slide. Some of those, as you can see, are related to racers' ranking and performance and the live coverage of the event, as well as fan engagement, uh, encouragement, sorry, which proves Twitter's role as a second screen, especially with regards to the TV broadcast of sport events. Uh, interestingly enough, the history of the Oster Grand Prix brand is a topic driving significant engagement among the audience. Right. So actually, uh, well, the power of social media analytics shows up when we combine some of the metrics and data 
obtained through qualitative and quantitative analysis. There's the two charts on this slide represent how the size of our predefined audiences or author types and conversation topics relate to the size of their respective follower bases and the percentage of original content they produce. More specifically, the, the chart on the right allows us to map influential audiences and authors and target them as part of influencer outreach programs. Unsurprisingly, media outlets and celebrities seem to drive the most engagement around the Ostergrand free brand with a balance of original content and retweets. Uh, well, you know that much of the content that gets retweeted and goes on to trend on Twitter is generated by traditional media outlets such as the New York Times, CNN, ESPN or local media outlets. So, uh, ironically, one of the best ways to influence the conversation on Twitter is actually to influence the traditional media. Uh, the chart on the left reveals the potential of the conversation topics to drive engagement around the event. In this regard, for example, efforts on the part of the event organizers to move the UGP brand over time to the right and then up on the chart may turn out to be an important brand management level. If we go further in our analysis, using uh, Cometric's patented influencer network analysis methodology, we can visualize the most discussed topics and the connectors to the most prominent author types on a cluster map. By the way, in, in the Candel section of the webinar, you can download our guides to social media analytics and influencer network analysis. So I'm sure you would find them interesting if you want to go deeper into these subjects. So uh, back to the cluster map, the, the size of the squares represents the prominence of the topic and the size of the circles represents the level of Twitter activity of the respective audience type. The thickness of the connectors then represents the level of engagement of the respective author around the conversation topics. This type of influencer mapping is invaluable in identifying key influencers and emerging topics in social media, as well as the endorsers, swing voters, and critics in a conversation. And towards the end, the, the last and probably the most important stage uh, of the PCM model, the allegiance stage, uh, in this stage we turn to basically creating positive emotions and experiences for sport consumers which leads to loyalty and devotion towards sport objects. Social media analytics in this regard can help us uncover consumer stories on social media which can propel brand storytelling with a high degree of authenticity. Uh, the example we have here is based on social listening on Facebook through Facebook topic data again. And uh, our platform analyzed all Facebook interactions related to the Under Armour brand for a week in July. Uh, well, the data provides interesting insights, as you can see, into the demographics, location, and content driving engagement among the fans for the brand, with the most prominent being Andy Murray's second Wimbledon victory. And what is even more interesting is the amount of interactions related to the feeling of happiness in the context of Murray's triumph and Under Armour, which is sponsoring him. 
So how can brands use uh, emotions to stay hot to consumers, uh, especially millennials? So I will wrap up the second part of the webinar by providing an answer to this question. Well, you probably think there is no real formula for happiness, but surprise, surprise, there is. And this is quite serious. Uh, re research shows that happiness is a combination of genetics and controllable, and controllable environmental factors and finally volition. Well, in some exact proportions, <laughs> as you can see. What this formula reveals is that with our brands and products, we will only be able to influence about 40% of consumers' feelings of happiness. Well, one way to do this is to monitor consumer behavior on social media and try to find out what makes consumers happy and then use those insights or memes, if you want, to tell authentic stories about your brand. And I think that's all for me. So now is part to answer your questions. And I, uh, again, draw your attention to the guides uh, in the handout section. So we're open for questions. I think okay, Georgia, so the, the, the yeah, first it, question, yeah, Jeff, so I, I think you can yeah, uh, address it. What, what, what's the first question? How do you measure the value of each marketing channel for the Oster Grand Prix? How do you know what is the most effective channel? Hmm. Um, so what we would do first of all is we have a, a matrix of each of the channels so that could be, for example, email, it could be events, uh, it could be social media, it could be uh, TV, and then what we do is we, we uh, identify the numbers involved, so if the database is 5,000, 10,000 emails, if the event is 700 people, if the social media reaches 100,000, if the TV is two, you know, whatever million, and then what we would do, where we can measure it would be on a lot, predominantly on digital. So email, social media would be on Facebook, uh, Insight and, and, and uh, Twitter analytics. Uh, we would do the same with email. When it comes to the broader events, that would all be through uh, quantitative research. So we would be going to the fans and asking the fans what did they think of the event? Uh, what did they take out of it? Did they buy from the event? Uh, will they tell other people ab about the event? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, on TV, we would then measure awareness, awareness of the event, likelihood to come. So if it's digital, we can measure it much more clearly. Uh, if it's not, then it's all through quantitative research. So those would be the main ways. The other ones that you would say, there would be the standard uh, number of people, if you have an event that you're doing during bike week, the number of people who come to your event as per what came last year, and also the media exposure that was generated around that event. So if there was one event during bike week and we had an increase of 10%, we would say, okay, great. Uh, if we would also say that we got an increase of opportunities to see, which we would measure, uh, because of the PR, then we would also say, okay, great, so we've got more opportunities to see, greater awareness, and more people went to the event. 
What we then would ask is, out of all of those people, or all of those sort of digital, if it was a specific campaign, i.e. an early bird offer, how many or how much of those people have actually turned into sales? So uh, we would develop and identify, first of all, all of the channels to market, who they're hitting, when they're hitting, and then compare that between last year and, and, and this year in a range of areas. In essence, digital will be the, through the insights, um, events will be through quantitative or qualitative research, so focus groups uh, or online research, or if it's a broader TV opportunities to see um, reports that we would that we would get. Um, for for us overall, we are looking um, to make sure that each of the events are really well. Um, enjoyed by the fans, so we would put a research, we would put a, a research or a, a questionnaire to make sure the fans have enjoyed the event, and uh, so that, that, that hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Jeff. So the next question is uh, also related to to the uh, UGP, the Oscar Grand Prix, uh, and uh, our. Subscriber wants to know how which countries the tourists came from and how is that reflected on Twitter location engagement? So maybe yeah. here we can also, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean I, I'll talk broadly and then maybe uh, Yogi, if you want to to, to talk about yeah. Uh, so from my point of view, uh, it's mainly um, outside of Northern Ireland. It's the Republic of Ireland, our neighbour country. It's the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, predominantly. Um, then it's Germany. Then it is Italy, Spain, France. Uh, and then after that, a couple of other places like Switzerland. And then after that, there'll be a number from uh, Australia, a number from Toronto, stroke uh, Canada, and a number from, from America. But it would almost go down greatly on, on that list that I've just went through. Mm. Yeah. So, and maybe I can add uh, also from from analytics perspective. Uh, so, in our analysis, Twitter analysis on on the Oscar Grand Prix, uh, we basically did a, a combination of uh, quantitative analysis. So, those uh, we we took those uh, tweets which had uh, disclosure of location. And then the ones that which did not have were analyzed qualitatively uh, to infer uh, essentially the, the location. And in the cases when that is not possible, of course, these uh, tweets fall into an unspecified category, which is you know one one drawback on uh, on ge geolocation disclosure on social media. Another very interesting topic, Jeff, which uh, can also be answered from both uh, your perspective and and uh, ours, is how do you feel? Uh, what do you feel is key to help attract younger fans for sports? Uh, because here we basically did not uh, speak about uh, uh, age, the uh, age segmentation, but. What is the, the key thing to attract younger audiences? And, that's an, and, and that, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an excellent uh, question. I think first and foremost what we would do, I mean I, part of my work is with the Ulster Grand Prix but I, I do a lot of work with uh, FIFA and other sports around the globe and it does change from sport to sport but what a lot of people are doing to attract uh, the millennials, uh, especially in America, would be the stadium. So the stadium is full Wi-Fi. So almost whatever the millennium what is doing in his home, can they do that at the stadium? So can they connect to their device? Can they find out what stats that they are? Can they look at a different angle uh, live at the stadium? You know, because they're going to do that at home. Can they look at the stats? Can they order 
uh, just like what they would do, can they order some food uh, from uh, the comfort of their, their, their seat? So a lot is around, let's say, the infrastructure and the, the Wi-Fi structure at the stadium is number one. Number two is all around uh, the people who go to it, especially if they are an older age group. How can you get them to bring their son and their daughter to, or their, son, their grandson and granddaughter to the event? In the main, in, in, in the UK, um, people went to a football game because their dad or their mum uh, brought them to a game. So there is still that little bit of how can you use you know, the influencer in the home that attracts through an offer or a campaign to bring their, their, their child to the event. So one bit of it is around the facilities. That's both the digital side as well as having great facilities. Uh, one bit is uh, around the attraction of the people who currently go to get their daughter and granddaughter uh, to go with them. The other thing is as well in sport, whether we like it or not, people follow a winning team. So if the team's doing well on the field, then you can guarantee that it will be doing well off the field in terms of spectators. But even if it's not, it's making sure that that fan's journey from the home to the stadium or to the event and back again is great, it's easy, parking is easy, getting a ticket is easy, uh, there's great atmosphere at the event, it's that whole package that needs to be looked at. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and I, I can just uh, add from, from, uh, from our perspective, from my perspective, with regards to social media, uh, how can we ensure that we attract younger fans. First, uh, from the point of view of uh, social media platforms, uh, you really need to know where this younger your younger audience hangs uh, about. Whether it's on uh, on Facebook, uh, more or less so, or Twitter, and ultimately on Instagram, Snapchat, or and you basically need to to be where your audience hangs out, no, not uh, where you you think that uh, they are. And this is of course done through research. Uh, oh, that's what we at Cometric uh, basically help our clients find out. And from mm -hmm. a content perspective point of view, it's important for younger, uh, for young audiences, Generation Z and Generation Y, uh, is to to use as as you uh, saw in in the last uh, part of the second panel, uh, emotions, uh, gamification, uh, because this this basically draws a connection to to their love for uh, video games. So these are uh, important tools to, to attract the younger audiences. Jorgi, I think that's a good point. I mean, one other thought I would say is that you're creating events that are targeted at uh, that millennial age group. Let me give you an example. With the Ulster Grand Prix, we are starting to look at an eSports offering and the eSports will be that you can race live on the Ulster Grand Prix circuit, um, use it, you know, whether we're going to do live at the event. So what we're doing is we're driving people to come to our event. Uh, so, so we have signed up with a, a gamification company. They have already put our uh, circuit onto their game that you can play on various platforms. And what we're trying to do, can we create a millennial related event where these gamers can go and play against each other in the area of esports, but they're racing on the Ulster Grand Prix circuit virtually? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, the next question I, I think is, is very interesting, and I think you, Jeff, you will be able to give us really first hand experience. And it's uh, how could a, a brand ensure they're getting value out of sponsorship? That's really practical <laughs> question. Yeah, so 
the question is how can a brand get value out of a sponsorship? Yeah, how, how could a brand ensure they, they get value out of a sponsorship? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, from my point of view, I think what's very important, um, if you're a brand owner, the first thing I would be saying is, what's your objectives? What are you trying to achieve? Now, I know that sounds very simple, but many people have not actually defined, clearly defined with a, a very clear figure exactly what is it they're looking to achieve at the end of the sponsorship area. Now, for me, I think where a brand can get value is number one, building brand awareness with uh, on the back of an events fan base. So if people are looking to get to the Ulster Grand Prix or to the football, uh, a football uh, audience, the, the key thing for me would be, okay, if, if me as a brand wants to get to your fan base, how can I build the brand awareness to get to that fan base so they think positively about me, first of all, and that they think positively about me if a decision comes to select a product that they will buy the product from me, the sponsor, because I'm involved with your sport. So I think number one for me would be what's the objectives? Very clear. Number two, then if it's about brand awareness, it's how do you raise brand awareness with the target audience and to the point that you raise target that brand awareness that, that then when people decide what they want to buy, that they were more likely to buy you because of the relationship with your sport. I think that the, that the third area is data collection. So all of that area in terms of getting data off the fans that you're, you're looking to get to, you will have value in the sponsorship if you're getting data that you could talk to these people on a regular basis. I think obviously social influence is another area where, you know, where the brand can get value if they can get social influencers to really, you know, uh, get on board, you know, with their brand and there'd be real value in that. And then the last one is, is pure sales, where how can they help if, they, if they're driving sales, well then there's value that's held in the sponsorship, but driving sales may not necessarily be to uh, the fans of the people that you've sponsored. It might be used from maybe other suppliers that you're working with or other maybe business customers that you're looking to influence by bringing them to the event that you sponsor. And that day out to them has created a real unique experience that's really deepened the relationship that maybe confirms in a sale for them because they sponsor that event. So for me, in a nutshell, I would be saying, how does a brand get value? Well, I think I'd be saying, well, what are you looking to get first of all? What's the objectives? And if you do know those objectives, it has to be to me around the area of brand awareness to that target market, that they have influenced that target market to think positively about you, so whenever they go to purchase, they will purchase from you. The value around that data collection, the value around social influence, and their value around driving sales either to that fan base or to other businesses or other uh, um, suppliers that you're looking to, to, to bring on board and to influence by, by helping them come to an event and have a great day out. Right, yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Jeff. And one last question, which I will uh, briefly answer. Uh, has Pometric developed a media analytics framework to measure where a brand sits on the uh, PCM, the psychological continuum model, that shows which categories are the most active for the brand and where the opportunities are? Uh, quite a long, uh, long one, but uh, well, yeah, the the framework uh, was uh, developed specifically for for this project, and this uh, basically uh, reflects our approach at Cometric. Uh, we we build extremely customized solutions, and uh, in cooperation with uh, with our clients. So so basically we. Uh, developed in in conjunction with them a framework, uh, and based on their brief, we can uh, provide a, a 
deep level of, uh, of analysis and, and insights, uh, which would essentially uh, show uh, where the opportunities are and other important aspects uh, uh, of interest to the brand. So I think there are no more questions and thank you again everyone for, uh, for joining us. Uh, we'll be sending a recording of the webinar and you can visit also our uh, website for uh, additional resources on the topics. Have a nice day and uh, see you soon.